All right, I want to talk about sermon types. This also is a very helpful truth to have a handle on. Because, again, I think that many of us make a mistake right here. Let me go, let me go ahead and, and put these up on the board here. I want to look at three different styles of preaching or sermon preparation. One, we're going to call it topical, a topical sermon. Then we're going to call the second one an expository. And the third, we're going to call a textual sermon. So first of all, the topical sermon is what most of our preachers do, honestly. And sadly, it is probably the weakest form of preaching and the least effective form of preaching. A topical sermon works like this. We have a subject on our heart, or we have an issue, or we, we feel we see a need in the church, so we want to preach on it. Pick any number of topics. Like I said, it could be prayer, it could be giving, it could be outreach, it could be faithfulness. So what we, what we often do is we pick our favorite scripture that remotely applies, we read that, and we launch off on a 45-minute lecture based on the fact that we read a scripture that remotely applies. And oftentimes we will bring in other scriptures. It is the weakest form of preaching for a number of reasons. One reason is that you get in a rut. You say the same things over and over again. Pastor Mitchell's, one of his quotable refrains is miscellaneous thoughts on a religious topic. i to write that down. Miscellaneous thoughts on a religious topic. And sadly, that describes a lot of what passes as preaching in our generation. The second one would be expository preaching, which you very rarely ever hear in our fellowship. This would be more what you'd probably hear from somebody that's graduated from seminary. A lot of Baptists preach this way. It's not a bad way to preach, and actually uh, it wouldn't be a bad idea to learn how to preach this way. I'd never really had much exposure to this personally until that same trip where me and Greg Mitchell connected in Africa, I went to preach for him. And we went out to breakfast and he said, okay, Tom, he said, look, you got to help me with a sermon here. He said, I've made a commitment to my church that I'm going to preach through the book of Colossians every Wednesday night until I'm done. I went, Whoa, that's a scary thought. But what an incredibly novel thought. So he said, okay, I'm at Colossians chapter 3. He said, so, let's get to work. You know, what we began to do is we began to dial into the fact that the Word of God was not written in verse. It was written in paragraphs. You know that? Those are artificial. The, the, the verse and chapter breaks are really artificial. Sometimes the chapter breaks are right in the middle of a thought and shouldn't be there that way. And again, that's not a flaw in the Bible. That's just somebody who decided to number every verse and arrange it. What you want to do is you want to, when you want to preach accurately, you want to dial into what's the paragraph. Because the paragraph is, the, is, is a thought. It's a body of thought. We figured, okay, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. And verse 1 is the beginning of the thought. I'm going to say that we went verse 1, verse 2, verse 3, and verse 4. I think that was our goal. Let's build a sermon. Let's preach those four verses. I had never done this before. I'm like, wow, this is new. So think about this. It forces you to look at what the Bible is actually saying. That's an amazing concept. Not what I want to say, using a scripture to back what I want people to do. I have to engage my mind and say, what is this saying? 
It's a life-changing moment for me because we rarely think that way. And often we're not building our sermons that way, but this is a turning point for me. So, so we began to say, you know, if you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on earth. For you died and your life is hid with Christ in God. What a powerful statement. We had to wrestle. What does that mean? Our life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you shall appear with him in glory. So already you ought to be thinking about, what is this saying? You can go on to verse 5, Therefore put to death your members which are on earth. Again, that was many years ago, and I don't remember exactly the sermon. I'm sure it's in my file somewhere. But I'm going to tell you, it, it changed the way I thought about building a sermon. And I thought, what a brave, what a brave announcement to make to your church. I'm going to preach through the entire book of Colossians on Wednesday nights till I'm through the whole book. That means you have to get in there and say, what is being said here? So the minute you start looking at the Bible that way, it's like, who wrote it? Why did he write it? What was he talking about when he wrote it? When did he write it? What are the contexts? And, and from that day till today, uh, it, it's changed the way I study the Bible and put my sermons together. And it was a very powerful experience for me. I've never had the nerve to make that announcement myself, but it really does make you say things you never thought of. I have never thought of preaching on what it means that my life is hid with Christ in God. That's a, that's a revelation that's in the Bible. That'll help people to know what that means. So this is called expository preaching. On a regular basis, admittedly, it might become dry. It might become wooden. If you've ever listened to the, to the radio preachers that do this, a lot of times it's teaching more than preaching. It can lose its flair. It can be too much information all at once. It, it could be the shotgun approach to truth. And it may lack what we call the rhema, the rhema word for your church, which you have to learn to get. But having said that, it would help us to become more academic-minded. We've eschewed the whole Bible school, and rightfully so, but... You must have an academic side to your thinking or you're going to fail as a preacher. Just because these guys in the, in the New Testament were ignorant, unlearned men, that didn't mean that God wanted them to stay that way. Right? It was cute. The reason they said it was kind of cute. Look at these guys, never been to school and they got dominion. But that wasn't God's ideal. Study to show yourself approved, our text says. A workman that needs not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. That means you drive a straight path through the Bible. You're going to have to educate yourself and learn to think academically. Because if you don't, you're not going to appeal to thinking human beings. And there are people that think out there. And if you can deliver something that feeds them and challenges them, I'm telling you, people will look forward to coming to church. So that's expository preaching. Textual preaching then is a combination of the first two. And the best preachers in our fellowship are textual preachers. Meaning, many times there is a topic, but their thoughts are taken from a body of Scripture. And that right there, to me, is the gem. That's my favorite kind of preaching to listen to, because it's revelation. When you decide that you're going to preach on something, but you're going to submit to the text, what makes you do it? makes you mine from that body of Scripture things you never thought of, things that you're not going to think of on your own, because it's God's words. How novel is that? Today I'm going to preach something that God says. Not just what I want people to do and, and apply a Scripture to it, and off I go. And between my text and my sermon is a great gulf fixed. And that's a shame because there's, there's so much rich truth here. So again, when I began to think this way, the best sermons I've ever preached come from this mindset. Because I'll end up seeing things I didn't expect to see. This is where revelation comes from. 
This is where the rhema comes from, that, that word for the moment, that rhema word. You have the logos, it's always the word of God. But that rhema is as you're, you're mining this, and the Bible says you, you have to search for this as treasure. This is work. God has deliberately made it that way. When you begin to dig and pick and, and shovel at a, at a text and, and begin to research the Greek and read the commentators and look at it again and bring a train of thought, I'm telling you, the Holy Ghost honors that. I brought a couple sermons that you have. Pastor Mitchell working with men who fail. And then one of my conference sermons that I distinctly remember approaching it this way and how God just gave me stuff that I just didn't know that was even in the Bible. For my conference sermon, I had a thought that I wanted to preach perhaps on the account. Fruit to your account. I'm going to have Philippians 4, so let's turn there for a minute. So what I'll do is, if there's something I want to preach on. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to see if it's in the Bible. Okay? I'm going to see if I can defend what I want to say scripturally. And that's funny, but sometimes it's a rebuke. If you can't find it, don't preach it. If you can't find a text that says that you want to say, then bail out and find something else to preach on. So I'm thinking I want to preach on giving, uh, this thing about the account. And then I got to thinking about compounding interest. That's an interesting financial thing, you know. So anyway, as I get to Philippians 4, and I'm looking up the whole thing about the account. Now you Philippians, this is 15 through 19. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica you sent once aid once again for my necessities. Not that I seek a gift, but I seek fruit that abounds to your account. That was the scripture that attracted me. But I'm reading this. I'm looking for, I'm looking for point three. I'm looking for where's the reward? Where's the, where's the motivators here? For I indeed have all and abound. I am full and have received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory. There it is. How many times have we quoted that scripture out of context? That scripture is in the context of giving for world evangelism. And I had never seen that before. I'd preached it, I'd quoted it, I'd prayed over it. So I began to dig at this, okay? And the revelation that really stirred me was the sweet-smelling sacrifice. I thought, wow, I've read that before in the Bible. Where have I read that before? So I began to look it up, and I found Noah. It said, he offered burnt offerings, and the Lord smelled a sweet savor. And the Lord said, I will not curse the ground again. Ephesians 5, 2, as Christ also loved us and gave himself as an offering and a sacrifice to God, a sweet-smelling savor. There it is again. Ezekiel 29, 18, you shall burn the whole ram. It is a burnt offering, a sweet-smelling savor. So here is this connection between sacrificial giving and Christ on the cross and God having mercy on the earth And Ephesians, us giving ourselves like Christ as a sweet-smelling savor. And right there is the heartbeat of God. I did not expect to go that direction. I wouldn't have thought of that on my own. I'm submitting to the text. I'm I'm looking at it and going, what does this say? And that made my sermon. That, That truth made my sermon. And I did not open the Bible thinking, man, I need to make this my sermon. So that's what I'm talking about. When you begin to think that way, when you're beginning to put sermons together, you can have a topic. But don't just pick your favorite text, read it, and launch off on your lecture. Instead, find a body of scripture that says what you feel the Bible says. Make sure, can I find this in the Bible? And then look look around. I call it Google out a little bit. You got your scripture. Now, Now back up a little bit. And sometimes I'll read the whole chapter, and I'm trying to get my mind, what is the context of this? Where was Paul when he wrote this? Well, he was in prison. Why did he write it? Well, he's writing it because he's encouraging a church that gave. And and thought, this is World Evangelism Night. This is it right here. 
and then the sweet smelling savor, and then the payoff is 19. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory. And that word according means in proportion to. So there's your multiplication. So these are things that you find as you're digging about, okay? But that's a textual sermon. And this is when preaching for me gets really enjoyable. I can remember a sermon I preached called Someone Else. I've preached this sermon all over the world. And it has to do with Jesus washing the disciples' feet. I remember putting that sermon together because I was going to go a completely different direction. I kind of had an idea about this, this moment. But as I began to approach this text in this mindset rather than the way I would have prior, I'm telling you, stuff started jumping out that I had never seen before. The Word of God's alive. How many of you know that? You can take a body of Scripture and preach it four times and get four completely different sermons, and they'll all be true. Because you have a different tack, you have a different topic. But if you'll submit to the text, then I'm telling you, it will change your preaching. And it takes it beyond our limited intellect. That's that sermon. So what I'd like you to do is at some point, take it, listen to it, and follow the notes. Because I always, when I was beginning to dial into this, I always thought, man, I wish I had a copy of that guy's notes. You ever wished when somebody preached, you could just see... How do you connect the dot? What does it look like from your vantage point? And so I thought that would help you. The other sermon is uh, Pastor Mitchell working with people who fail. This was a men's rally in Phoenix. This was after I had spent some time with Pastor Mitchell. And I began to see the pattern in how he put his outlines together. I noticed a pattern, and I'm going to talk about that tomorrow. I sat down with a blank piece of paper, got out my pencil, and I said, okay, I'm going to see if I can outline Pastor Mitchell's sermon. I'm going to see, as he preaches, if I can reproduce his outline. And I couldn't believe how easy it was. And I don't mean that to say it's elementary. I mean that once I discovered that he has a technique, he has something of a template that he follows. And again, I asked him point blank. I called him. I said, I noticed that you follow this template. I said, do you always do that? Did you learn that in Bible school? Where did you learn how to do that? Because I notice a lot of the old preachers do that. It's teaching by contrast. Point one, uh, the power of holiness. A will be what holiness is not, and B will be the text says. And that was the format that I discovered in sermonizing sessions that Pastor Mitchell uses. So I sat down. I said, I'm going to try to reproduce his outline, and it just fell into place. I just said, wow. So then I typed it out. And you should take this and listen to it because he is pulling truth out of this chapter that is stunning. Philemon. And you can study this yourself, but it's all there. In other words, it's, that's what it's saying. This is what Pastor Mitchell does. And this is what all your favorite preachers do. This isn't just something that it's not the lottery where some people get it and other people don't. You can do this. And men that learn how to do this, they instantly become better preachers. Because really, it's about the Word of God, isn't it? It's not about us. It's about speaking what God's Word says. So so that's there. I want you to take that. And basically, I want to close it off right there. It's a very short second session so that we can discuss if we want to. But if you look at John Stott here, Christian preaching is not the proud ventilation of human opinions. It's the humble exposition of God's Word. Bible expositors bring out of scripture what is there they refuse to thrust into the text what is not there they pry open what appears closed they make plain what seems obscure unravel what is knotted and unfold what is tightly packed in in expository preaching the biblical text is neither a conventional introduction to a sermon on a largely different topic nor a convenient peg on which to hang a ragtag of miscellaneous thoughts but a master which dictates and controls what is said. That's his way of saying miscellaneous thoughts on a religious topic. Great preachers learn this secret. 